Thank you, Titus. Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28? 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Uh, just a few announcements leading up to the Christmas break. Our Christmas break is coming up. And uh, our last class before the Christmas break is Sunday, December 17th, this coming Sunday. And then we'll resume classes Sunday, January 7th. So all the classes in between those dates are we're not having. The usual days that we beat, we will not be having because I'll be out in the East Coast. So last class, Sunday, December 17th. And then we resume classes uh, Sunday, January 7th. And uh, so we're going to uh, continue our study here this evening of 1 John. We're, uh, we're almost done with this uh, fifth major section of the book of uh, 1 John. We're almost uh, starting Thursday. We're going to actually uh, get into a study of actually what is the heart of the epistle and the, uh, the, the, uh, the guts of the epistle, which is revolving around the command to love one another. So um, it's quite interesting because of the chiastic structure of 1 John, as we mentioned in our introduction, and many times in the past is why we can say that. All right, so we're going to uh, do that uh, work on 1 John 3.10 here this evening, noting that the believer who does not practice righteousness by no means possesses the characteristic originating from God, and that characteristic, as we'll see, is God's righteousness. So uh, we're supposed to reflect the character of our Heavenly Father, and not the character of the devil, which is uh, his character is he can be characterized as, as a sinner, of course, uh, and um, and we are to be characterized by righteousness because that's how God that's God's character and nature, and He's righteous. So, anyways, uh, uh, that'll be our subject here this evening. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. We do this uh, moment of silent prayer for a couple of reasons. One, we might be having a tough day or something, and we're might be a little distracted, running into Bible class or whatever. Uh, so we need a little bit of time to get our bearings, but also the other, uh, the most important thing is that we take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. We don't want to be harboring any known sin and uh, unconfessed sin, and uh, that would cause us not to be in fellowship with God, and we want to be in fellowship with God if we want to hear what the Holy Spirit is going to say here this evening through the communication of the Word of God. That's why I have to be filled with the Spirit and you as well. So, uh, this is a time where to worship the Father and the Son, and we do this in the power of the Spirit. And in order to do that, we need to be in fellowship with God, which would require us to confess our sins if necessary. 1 John 1, 9, that restores us to fellowship with God, and we maintain that fellowship by our obedience to the Word of God. And when we do that, we're obeying the Holy Spirit because He's inspired the Scriptures, and He speaks to us through the Scriptures. And so uh, would, uh, anything, is anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, you should do this anyways, but uh, apply First Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us so graciously. We thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sins. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son to the cross to us when we were yet uh, your enemies and also raising us up and seating us with your Son, Jesus Christ, when we were dead in our sins and transgressions. We pray, Father, that you would help us to always remember that, to keep us humble, and also to be, uh, avoid self-righteous arrogance and thinking we're better than other people. And uh, we just thank you, Father, for the fact that uh, you sent your Son to the cross to save us and to have us have a relationship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and a fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and other members of the body of Christ. We thank you for the fact that we are members of the body of Christ. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection, and identifying us with your Son in his death and resurrection, giving us the victory over sin and Satan. We pray that you would help us to appropriate by faith this identification and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to you. Help us to persevere, to keep going, 
and to uh, when we fail, that we pick up the, confess our sins and pick up the pieces and keep going forward and persevere. We know that uh, none of us is perfect and we won't be perfected until we receive that resurrection body. And we just thank you for giving us the victory over sin and Satan in a perfective sense when we get that resurrection body, Father. Father, we also uh, pray that you would uh, help us all here to worship you and your son this evening by the power of the Spirit. We pray that the Spirit would use me mightily as his instrument to accurately interpret and to communicate your word here this evening. We pray that the Spirit would also work mightily and powerfully through your people and helping them to understand what I'm saying here at the pulpit and to guide them in the application of these things. Help all of us to be humble and sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We thank you for everyone here t uh, this evening in the Thompson home and those who might be listening or viewing this class live through the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website or wherever else this lesson might be seen or viewed at or heard. So, Father, we also thank you for Titus' work with the sound of recordings. We thank you for this service. We pray you give him wisdom in that area this evening. And we also thank you for his, not only his service, but those who are taking advantage of the technology and the technology itself, Father. We also thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson and opening up their home to us four days a week and the sacrifices that they've made over the last seven, over seven years now so that we could uh, communicate the word four days a week. We just thank you, Father, for raising them up in their family. So, Father, we just uh, pray for this service and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. I'm going to read verses 1 John 2, 28 to 1 John 3, 10, as I've been doing. Uh, even though our verse is verse 10, I do this because I want to uh, study verse 10 in its context. And also verse 10, 1 John 3, 10, is uh, the final verse in this fifth major section of 1 John, which began in 1 John 2, 28, which centers upon the practice of righteousness. In particular, uh, John in these verses is trying to uh, reassure, uh, uh, instruct his, uh, the recipients of 1 John, remind them of these things that he's taught them in the past, that if they want to have confidence at the Bema seat, where they, uh, when Christ comes back at the rapture, then we get our resurrection bodies at that time, and then immediately after we have the Bema seat and we have to uh, have our service, our uh, stewardship of our time, talent, and treasure uh, uh, evaluated by him to see if we merit rewards or not. So he's saying in these verses, 1 John 2.28 to 1 John 3.10, uh, if you practice righteousness, uh, you, will uh, you will have confidence when you stand before Christ to, uh, to receive that evaluation of your service. And of course, as we've seen in the past, if you practice in righteousness, and he alludes to this in the very last statement in verse 10 of 1 John 3, uh, when you practice in righteousness, you're practicing God's love in your life. And this righteousness, as we'll see again this evening, is a divine, is a divine righteous, not righteousness. It's not a human righteousness, relative righteousness. It's an absolute righteousness that is a part of the character and nature of God. And so John in these verses is telling, uh, telling the recipients of 1 John who were Christians in the Roman province of Asia in the final century of the first, uh, first century AD that uh, if you're gonna, you need to reflect the character of your heavenly father and your, and your savior, Jesus Christ, and they're righteous. So we need to practice righteous, righteousness like they do. So uh, when we talk about righteousness, it's, it is related to loving God and loving our fellow human being, our fellow Christian. Uh, practice in righteousness basically means you're fulfilling your obligations uh, to both God and man, uh, your fellow non-believer, your non-believing uh, friends and family and whatnot, uh, or people who are not related to you at all, and your fellow Christian. And uh, our obligation to God is to love him with our entire being and strength and our which our obligation to our fellow human beings is to love our neighbors herself. And uh, our obligation to the Christian community, each individual member, is to love them as Christ loves us. The command of John 13, 34, which is also found in John 15, 12. So uh, we can see that John's actually building, uh, he's using different metaphors. The, you know, righteousness is, uh, is one of them. And he, he's building on to things. He's, if you notice, he's progressing here. And it's all a revol this, uh, this epistle is all a revol revolving around uh, how these Christians that he's writing to continue that, so that uh, how they can continue to experience fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and other believers who are obedient to the apostolic teaching, which is now in our New Testament, which John communicated. So uh, uh, fellowship is, when we practice righteousness, as we've been pointing out, if we're practicing God's righteousness in our life and fulfilling our obligations to both God and me and our fellow Christian, uh, if we're doing that, we're having fellowship with God. Uh, we studied in the past that when we're experiencing our salvation, that's experiencing our salvation is 
speaking of experiencing fellowship with God from the perspective that you're experiencing a deliverance over sin and Satan. That's what salvation is about. Sanctification. If we're practicing our, experiencing our sanctification, well, that means that we're experiencing our fellowship with God, but from the perspective that we're experiencing being set apart exclusively to do God's will. And when we're practicing righteousness, uh, we're experiencing fellowship from the perspective that we're fulfilling our obligations to both God and our fellow human being, our fellow believer in the body of Christ. John also mentions knowing God experientially, or Jesus Christ experientially, uh, with the word ginosko in 1 John. And that speaks of experiencing fellowship with God from the perspective that you are personally encountering God, the different members of the, the three, all three members of the Trinity, through, the pro, uh, through fellowship, and you have fellowship with God by obeying His word. So uh, it's interesting, you know, everything he, John's saying is, is talking about fellowship from different perspectives. How do you experience fellowship with God? Which is the means? Obedience. And what is fellowship? How does it look like? Well, it's practice and righteousness. It's knowing God experientially, personally encountering him, being affected by that encounter. It's, uh, it's, and also, as we'll see uh, starting tomorrow and then in the next, uh, next couple of months, when we study 1 John 3, 11 through 18, it, fellowship with God means we're practicing God's love in our life. We're loving our fellow believer as Christ, as, as Christ has loved us and is loving us and will love us in the future. And this is true of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So uh, look at 1 John 2.28. I'm reading from the Net Bible. It says in 1 John 2.28, And now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, that's at the rapture, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame when he comes back. And then he starts explaining how they can ensure the fact that they will, will, they will have this confidence. If you know that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been fathered by him. Now, the first three verses of 1 John 3, he goes, it's a little of a parenthesis where he actually t develops the, con in fact, the Net Bible, <laughs> it's funny, I just noticed this. <laughs> the Net Bible puts the verses 1 through 3 in parenthesis in their translation. And that's a great, I, that's, it's perfect because that's exactly what's going on here. So, uh, because uh, he develops the concept of being fathered by God, which speaks of regeneration, in verses 1 through 3 of 1 John chapter 3, and then he resumes the discussion of practicing righteousness in 1 John 3, 4, if you notice. So he says in, to, 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 in verse 1 of chapter 3, developing uh, the concept of being fathered by God, he says, see what sort of love the Father has given to us that we should be called God's children and indeed we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him, Jesus. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that whenever it is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope focused on him purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Now, the reason, another masterful reason why John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put these verses in, verses 1 through 3, had this little parenthesis, because we're children of God, and a child is the practice, is to reflect the character of his father. In fact, we're to practice righteousness, because we're children of God, and God practices righteousness. He is righteous, okay? So that's why, one of the reasons why he flips those verses in there. Uh, then he says in verse 4 of chapter 3, everyone who practices sin... Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. And you know that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there's no sin. So they, therefore we need to act accordingly and not sin. Everyone who resides in him does not sin. That means everyone who's having fellowship with him is not sinning. When you're out of fellowship, that's when you're sinning. Everyone who sins has neither seen him nor known him. Not seeing him or knowing him is speaking of, the, of, of not having fellowship with him from different perspectives as we studied. Verse, verse, verse 7, he says, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. Therefore, we need to practice righteousness. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who has been fathered by God does not practice sin because God's seed resides in him and thus he's not able to sin because he's been fathered by God. So we have a nature that doesn't sin is what John's saying there. We sin because we live in the old Adamic nature. And when we're in fellowship with God, we're living in the new nature. The new nature can never sin because it's the nature of God. God doesn't sin. Verse 10, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed 
And as we saw by this is pointing to the very next statement. Everyone who does not practice righteousness, the one who does not love his fellow Christian is not of God. And notice that very last statement, which we're going to see tomorrow. The one who does not love his fellow Christian is not of God. The mention of loving, not loving a fellow Christian. So he's tying in the practice of right. The, the, notice the net Bible has the dash. That's basically saying the one who does not love his fellow Christian is not of God is explaining what he means ex, uh, in another way by someone not practicing righteousness. You're not loving them. If you're, not, if, if you're not practicing righteousness, then that means you're not loving them. That's what he's saying. And obviously the, the inference is this. If you're loving your fellow Christian, you're practicing righteousness. So notice how he joins it together there for us. So verse 10 is what, what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to look at the statement, everyone who does not practice righteousness. Uh, so uh, when you practice righteousness, you're manifesting the fact that you're a child of God. Now this right this is very important because the righteousness he's talking about is not a right a human righteousness. There's a different types of righteousness mentioned in the Bible. There's human self-righteousness and then there's God's righteousness. That God God's righteousness was given to us as a gift at our justification. God uh, we we as sinners we we trusted in Jesus as our savior whenever that was the the father imputed his son credited his son's righteousness to us, not because we did anything to earn or to deserve it, is by grace. He, sa- he gave us this imputation of righteousness because of the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, the object of our faith. He sees that righteousness in that split second. He declares us justified. That means he's accepted us into his family, and therefore nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. No sin that we could ever commit could cause us to lose our, that justification, That's that relationship with God. It's eternal. And it's a, when God makes a just decision, that's final, and it can't be rescinded. He's not a human judge where he can rescind decisions. And he doesn't make a mistake, okay, because he's, he's uh, all-knowing, wise God. So uh, that's what we have uh, going on here. We have this divine righteousness, and the unbelievers, what he's saying by inference, the unbelievers have no b- capacity whatsoever to practice this righteousness. Only a child of God who has God's righteousness in them uh, is able to, to practice this righteousness and also simultaneously practice divine love, the love that the Holy Spirit reproduces in us. Uh, the unbeliever can, does not have the capacity for that. He needs the Spirit. We've seen this many times in the past. So when he talks about righteousness here, he's not talking about human righteousness where we, you know, I'm righteous and I'm, I'm a good person. I give, uh, uh, I give money to the church and therefore God will accept me because I give this money to the church or I, um, I, I, I'm a moral person. I do, th- I do nice things for people like, for instance, certain, p- certain cults like the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses might have very moral people in there, but their righteousness is a, self, as a, a human righteousness when you compare their righteousness to other people. Yeah, they're, they're more righteous than other people. But when you compare all of us, including them and the Christian community, to God, uh, we, none of us measures up. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, so therefore, that righteousness that they are practicing as non-believers can never get them justified before God. That's what stum- the Jews stumbled over in Jesus' day. Paul mentions that at the end of Romans 9, and, and he mentions it in verse 10. They tried to achieve the righteousness of God by keeping the law. And as sinners, you'd have to keep the law perfectly for God to accept you, declare you justified based upon your own merits. But nobody could do that because, first of all, we're under, we're under the condemnation of Adam. We're, under, we're, we're united to Adam as non-believers. We're, we're, we're under the, his headship. And the only way to get out from that headship is to trust in the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So and God, in his, obviously in his wisdom, did it that way. And good thing. It was a good thing he did that. So uh, we could be saved on, on, on grace, by grace, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, he could uh, give us much more. Uh, that Adam ever lost when we trust in Jesus Christ. So this righteousness is something that's divine in quality and character. It's reproduced in our lives by the Holy Spirit when we obey the word of God. So in the ESV, they translate verse 10. By this is, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So we're going to look at whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. We're going to look at that, and then tomorrow we're going to know the command, uh, the uh, uh, not loving our brother tomorrow evening, and then Thursday 
we're going to have a, begin and have an introduction to 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 18. So uh, the word for righteousness, we've seen this word in the past. Those of you who studied Romans with me out in, uh, at uh, Prairie View years ago, they, that book uh, has this word all over it. And then we saw it in 2 Timothy. Uh, we've seen it in other places. And righteousness here, dikaiosune is the word in the, in the Greek for those who are interested. It refers in this context to a person exemplifying God's character and integrity and virtue, which constitutes righteousness. Or in, obviously, this is uh, speaking of somebody who doesn't do that. So it speaks of somebody not exemplifying God's integrity and virtue, which constitutes righteousness. Well, I, I mentioned virtue and integrity because that's what constitutes righteousness. We broke it down uh, in the past, what, what righteousness is. It speaks of God's integrity and virtue. And God wants us, to, uh, he's given it to us, credited to us at the moment of our justification, this, his virtue and integrity. Now we, it, our, the Christian way of life is about manifesting or exemplifying that righteousness, integrity and virtue of God in our own lives. So here, it refers to a believer exemplifying Christ-like character, which is perfectly sound by practicing righteousness. It speaks of, per, practicing righteousness speaks of perfectly adhering to God's perfect standards, which appear in the gospel. Now, here's the thing that, that uh, in the original, it, uh, you can't see in your translations, that I want to bring out to you. The, there's a, this word has the article in front of it. The article in Greek can do many things. It's much more diverse in its usage than English's article. The Engl article in English is the. And it's really interesting here. Here, what we, this word, Dikaya Sunni, is what we call an abstract noun. Now, when you, do, when you put the article before this type of noun, it particularizes the general quality of this noun. And what it does is it actually defines it more closely and it distinguishes this righteousness from other notions. So here, what this article is doing with this abstract noun, righteousness, dikaiosune, it's uh, distinguishing this righteousness, God's righteousness, from human righteousness, relative righteousness. Because God's righteousness is an, as absolute divine righteousness, where human righteousness, you know, doing good works in your own flesh, is relative righteousness, human righteousness. Relative means you're comparing yourself to other human beings. But as we said before, when we compare ourselves to God, None of us measures up. We're not perfect like God is. Now, people, this is the danger. This is what's self, bad about self-righteousness and the non-regenerate, uh, uh, the unregenerate community is that they think by doing good things, you know, help the old lady across the street, donate money to the church, build a wing in the cancer hospital, you know, give my time to help in the community. Those are all great things. Helping in the community, helping children, helping old, the elderly, that's great in itself, but some people actually, and this is probably my, the denomination I came out of as a, as, as a teenager, uh, the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, there's a tendency among Catholics to think, hey, I, I'm, I, I do good works, and this is true of the Jewish people as well, and in a lot of places, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 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 groups of people, different types of people throughout the world, they think that if I do good things like that, that that's going to give me brownie points with God, and so when I get into heaven... When I get in heaven, or when I get to the point where I die, let's put it this way, when I, get, when I die, then God will let me into the, you know, the pearly gates because I was a good person. And of course, they're all, they're all totally and completely deceived by the devil when they do that because you ain't, no one ain't making it. No one's perfect. And that's why when you evangelize somebody, you're talking to somebody about God, and you know, usually the best way is to do it one-on-one. -on -one. I've always done this. I've always said, we talk about this, and I said, are you perfect? And this is the thing you had to keep saying to them. Are you perfect? And of course they're not. They say, no, I'm not. I said, I'm not perfect either. We all have a problem then because God is perfect. And we like to poo-poo that and diminish that. That's what they do. That's what the sinners like to do. But God has standards he, he upholds and he ain't backing down from any of them. So he, that means he can't sneak us in the back door. He can't sweep our sins under the rug. He can't do that. He's got perfect standards. So, th so we had a big, big problem. And God said, I got the solution. My son, my one and only son, will become a human being, and he's perfectly righteous like me, and I will accept you. On his, when you have faith in him, I will accept you into my family forever, and I'll forgive you of your sins and all your sins, past, present, and future, all because of the merits of my son, Jesus Christ, because he's perfectly righteous, and I can accept his sacrifice on your behalf, uh, and so therefore I can save you 
because of what he did on the cross for you and, and, to, and give you my righteousness so that I can, you can live with me because I demand perfect righteousness and now you're going to have that righteousness when you have faith in my son, Jesus Christ. So the danger of the world, of the people in the world, and this happened, Paul mentions this about the Jews, doing good works is a good thing but that, don't think that that's going to get you, God's going to accept you because of these good works. He saves us for performing good works. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 1 through 10 we studied. Uh, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. And we are his workmanship, and we're to, he saved us for good works. He didn't save us on the basis of good works. We studied that in Titus chapter 3 and Romans. We're not saved on the basis of good works because... We're sinners and we're already condemned before God. So there's, there's nothing we could do, no matter how many good works we do, that could measure up to perfection because we're not perfect anymore. We're never perfect. So therefore, he is, uh, what God has done, and it, what God, God has done is that uh, the sinner has to, so there's nothing he can do. He has to trust in another, the perfect, his, God's perfect son, in order to receive this righteousness. And then, once you have his righteousness through faith in Christ, then you can have fellowship and a relationship with him. So God, this is very important. So people of the world have a relative righteousness. It's a human self-righteousness that we call. That's what you see in the Gospels. Jesus was constantly talking in the Gospels to the Jews that they had this Pharisaical notion that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm better than the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And they morally, yeah, they, in many ways that they were. Many ways they weren't because they were, you know, they were... Uh, they were uh, having a double, some of them were living double lives. Uh, but we see that they thought they were better than the tax collectors and the prostitute. And Jesus gave a parable of a guy going, you know, beating his breast and, oh, I'm a wicked sinner. And then the Pharisee down the road was like going, oh, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like this person beside me. You know, people do that all the time today. Oh, I'm better than the homosexual and lesbian. I don't practice lesbianism and I'm not, a, I'm not a homosexual. These people are wicked. I'm better than those people. God will accept me because I'm, I'm a nice, I'm, I'm a nice heterosexual person. Well, yeah, but you're also wicked, self-righteous. You're in work at worse darkness than they are. They know that they're 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 bad. Many of them, or the the uh, the, the the prostitutes, or the uh, the people who are involved in all kinds of sexual immorality. They obvious to them that they're they they they're awful. Uh, and then, but the self-righteous crowd thinks, I'm good. I'm better than everybody else. Because look at me. I'm more moral than those people. But God says, No, you're wicked. You're wicked. Just you're you're not you're measuring yourself by these other people, but if you measure you, all of you measure yourself to me, none of you make it. I don't. I can't accept any of you. I can only accept you through my through faith in my son, and that's a humbling thing. That's a humbling thing for everybody in the human race. One of the great dangers in the church is Christians going back to self-righteousness and thinking they're better than other people. The cross should humble us all and make us feel, you know what, I have no right to think I'm better than other Christians or in, you know, in, uh, in, in, in pass judgment on the Christians uh, or you know, try to measure them by me. Who am I? You know, I, need, I, I you, the, first, you've got to take out the log in your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. I say that because many self-righteous people don't realize how wicked they themselves are and how uncompassionate and impatient, uh, impatient and uh, cruel. And They don't realize how bad they are. And, they, they look, they're too, and, they, and the person beside them has a lot less problem than they do. And yet they spend their time poking at other people. Make sure you're right. Before you start poking at other people. That's what God wants us to do. And uh, a humble person looks at themselves in light of the cross and is patient with other people and forgiving of other people and uh, compassionate of other people, knowing that God has been compassionate and forgiving and, and very gracious to me. So that humbles us. And knowing that, you know, I, when other people fail, other people have uh, fall down in life, we're not sitting there going, you know, rubbing it in and, and, and stepping on them. It's like, you know, they, they, need a, they don't need that. They need the grace of God. That's what we need in our lives. And that's what a self-righteous person doesn't think that. They, they're lacking. You, I can always tell a self-righteous person. They're always, they're always... They, they don't give anybody grace. They don't show any compassion. They're not forgiving. It's, you know, they're just... They're just cruel and mean. And that's, you know, God doesn't want us to be like that. The, the, God, the cross should, hum, uh, should soften all of our hearts and make us compassionate to each other, everyone. 
And whether it's the homosexual, the lesbian, or the brother and sister in Christ that has fallen, has made a mess of their life. So righteousness here, I say all this, we're talking about the, uh, this righteousness that John's talking about in 1 John chapter 2, verses 2, 1 John 2, 28 to 1 John 3, 10. And throughout this book is a righteousness that's divine in quality and character. So specifically, this righteousness here that John's talking about in 1 John 3, 10, it speaks of a person practicing God's righteousness in their life after their justification, after their conversion. Now, the article that's before this word, dikaiosune, righteousness in the Greek, it also indicates that this word is in a class by itself and the only one tru truly deserving of the name. Thus, it's, in other words, it's saying, it's speaking of the righteousness which is of any value to God. So when I translate it, I, sometimes, I, I think I use true, I will see in a minute, this true, uh, truly righteousness. So what I'm trying to do is communicate what the article before this word is saying and so that you would understand what the original audience would have understood Paul to be saying, uh, John to be saying here. Now the word for, it says every, uh, the word everyone there is uh, the word or whoever. Whoever is translating the adjective pas, it's, uh, it's correctly translated. You could translate it everyone or anyone because the word pertains to totality with emphasis on its individual components. Here it's referring to any member of the body of Christ without exception. Uh, it's a generic subject, we call it. So he's, that means that's a tipping us off that because he's not speaking of any individual in the community, Christian community, or identifying them, he's speaking of, of just a hypothetical Christian or anyone in the Christian community without identifying who they are. That means he's tipping us off that this is a spiritual principle that's true of all, it's applicable to all Christians and everything that he's talking about here. So the word practice there, poieo, it's, uh, it mean, it's correctly translated, it's meaning it's negated by the negative particle may, which is denying any idea of a person practicing divine righteousness. So therefore, this verb is expressing the idea of any member of the body of Christ not practicing divine righteousness. The present tense is a gnomic present. It's used to describe something that is true any time it does take place. So the idea here with the present tense is not how often they're not doing it, uh, but rather that they just simply don't do it. It's, it's mentioned, it's, the present tense is basically saying this doesn't take place. Not how often it doesn't take place, but just that it doesn't take place because he's trying to communicate a principle here. And then the phrase is not from God. Uh, that uh, uh, The word for is. Now this is very important here. This is very interesting what John does here in 1 John, and he does it throughout the book, uh, throughout the rest of the book. He uses the word, the word there that's translated is in your uh, translation. We saw this last week or two weeks ago when it was used earlier in 1 John. Uh, the word is there is amy in the Greek. And it's correctly translated here. But what does he mean is? I mean, the, the, the idea here is of possessing a particular characteristic. So uh, the characteristic that's inferred here clearly is righteousness. So uh, the idea is possessing the, when he says it's not from God, he's saying, they, do, they uh, by no means possess the characteristic which originates from God. That's the idea. When he says is not from God, he's saying they don't pos they're not possessing the characteristic that originates from God. And when, he sa when I say that in experiential sense, um, and we know the Christian uh, positionally has this righteousness, it's indwelling in our souls, but he's talking about here, when he says not possessing this characteristic, he means you're not manifesting this characteristic. You're not, it's not an ex you're not experiencing the righteousness of God in your life because you're disobeying God. Now this verb's meaning is emphatically negated by the emphatic negative adverb ooh, and it, this word expresses an absolute direct and full negation. So therefore the idea with these two words is that it expresses the idea of a believer never possessing the characteristic which originates from the Father, and that characteristic by inference from the passage is righteousness. So this use of the word amy we saw corresponds with its usage in verse John 3, 8. In this verse, 1 John 3, 8, the verb speaks of the believer possessing the characteristic of sinning which originates with the devil. Uh, look at my translation please. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Let me show you this. Because you won't see it in your English translations. 1 John 3, 8. First John 3, 8, the one who at any time does practice that which constitutes sin does possess the characteristic originating from the devil. And what's that characteristic? Sin. How do we know that? Because what he says next. Because this devil has been sinning from the beginning. 
okay? Take that statement there and then look at verse 10 of my translation. He says, uh, by means of this, God's children are manifested as well as the devil's children. Any person who at any time does not practice that which constitutes true righteousness by no means possesses the characteristic originating from the one true God. So when we say, the, see the phrase, is not from God. He's saying they're not possessing the characteristic which originates from God. And the characteristic in the passage we're talking about is righteousness. And we saw this last, when we studied 1 John 3, 8, and we'll see it again tonight. The comparison in 1 John 2, 28 to 1 John 3, 10, he's not comparing really the children of the devil with the children of God. What he's doing, he's, he's, he's making a contrast uh, between two things. Con uh, the, co the contrast between practicing uh, righteousness and po possessing this characteristic, because you practice righteousness, and practicing sinning, and, and, pos and possessing uh, uh, the characteristic of sinning. We possess the, the uh, characteristic of sinning when we practice sin. We possess the, uh, possess the characteristic of righteousness when we practice righteousness. That's the contrast. That's what he's trying to do. Because he's talking to believers. And he's not trying to help them identify the children of the devil. Uh, they already know that. And they, can meet, and they, and know, they know that because if they reject the, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ... You can't get saved. That, that's a tip off that the person is an unbeliever because you have to get saved. You have to believe that Jesus is both God and man and, he, and to believe that, he rose, uh, that he's God and man, that would mean you have to believe in the resurrection because the resurrection proves he's God. So here we have uh, this word, uh, Amy, it means possess the characteristic uh, in verse John th uh, 3, 8 of uh, possess, possessing the characteristic of sinning, which originates with the devil. But now in verse 10, this word Amy in the phrase is not from God saying, they don't possess the characteristic which originates from God. That characteristic is righteousness. The word God there is referring to the Father in this context. Uh, it's tipped off by the words articular construction, which is in the New Testament commonly signifying uh, the noun theos as referring to the first member of the Trinity, unless the con context indicates otherwise. Now, we're going to see when we get to 1 John, I just finished it off, 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 6, we see that the word God there is used of the Holy Spirit when the article is in front of it, which is quite interesting. We'll talk about that when we get to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Context determines who the referent is, who he's talking about, and, and what the meaning of the, of the phrase is. Context is everything. So that, that's very important. That means you have to pay attention to details. That means you have to be a careful reader of your Bible. You have to be a careful reader and everything, really. I mean, imagine if we went to work and we weren't carefully reading what the, what the, you know, the, the email the boss put out or the directions, you know, somebody you, you, you were given. Uh, you, you can get yourself in pretty good tr trouble. You can get yourself kicked, uh, you know, fired. So we have to pay attention to details when we study the Bible. And I know that's not a popular thing. You've heard me say that before because most Christians are lazy, not my children. Anyways, now the articular uh, construction of this word is also expressing the idea that the Father is the one true God, or in other words, he's unique and one of a kind. Now, this word, theos, God, it says, uh, it is not from God. The word from is the preposition ek. It's correctly translated from because it's a marker of source, and the English word from is expressing that. This indicates that the believer by no means possesses the characteristic of righteousness which originates from the character and nature of God as a result of failing to practice righteousness. The present tense of this verb, a me, is, is not from God. It's used to make an absolute statement regarding the believer who at any time does not practice that which constitutes divine righteousness. Basically, it's an eternal spiritual truth. Look at 1 John 3.10 again in my translation. By means of this, God's children are manifested as well as the devil's children. Any person who at any time does not practice that which constitutes true righteousness, by no means possesses the characteristic originating from the one true God. Specifically, the one who at any time does not divinely love their fellow believers. So right there, and you see that in the, uh, the Net Bible's translation of verse 10, uh, they say fellow Christian, I say fellow believer. What he basically, John's, again, he's not, he's not talking about how you identify an unbeliever. Okay, He's talking about, how you guys can continue to have fellowship with God and practice righteousness, practice love. That's what he's saying. So keep practicing what you're doing, practicing righteousness, keep practicing love. We know that they were doing this because of 1 John 2, 12 through 14, where we study in 1 John 2, 21, he confirmed and affirmed and commended them, the, who he's writing to, for being faithful to his apostolic teaching and not falling 
for the deception of the false teachers who we saw in 1 John 2, 18 and 19 were non-believers. And he calls them antichrist. And he'll call them false prophets when we get to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. So the first statement in 1 John 3, 10 asserts that any person who at any time does not practice that which constitutes true righteousness by no means possesses the characteristic which originates from God. And that characteristic, as we've been pointing out, the context says, is righteousness. Therefore, John is teaching in a negative sense. He does this quite a bit. The biblical writers do this quite a bit. He's teaching something from a negative perspective. Sometimes he teaches it from the positive perspective. When I say negative, meaning if you don't do this, okay, you're not, uh, he wants to talk about practice and righteousness. Well, he's talking about it from the perspective of not doing it. So here, John's teaching in 1 John 3.10, in a negative sense, that the believer manifests the fact that they're a child of God by practicing divine righteousness. So he's saying, you're children of God, and this is how you manifest this. You practice righteousness. Then you're, that means you're possessing the characteristic of God's righteousness in your life through the practice of it. So you're to reflect the nature of your father. Again, this is something God is constantly telling us in Scripture. We're to reflect the character of our Heavenly Father. That to, 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 to do that, we need to know who our Heavenly Father is. And we know Him through Jesus Christ. So, we see that uh, righteousness, again, is dikaiosune. It's referring to a person exemplifying God's integrity and virtue, which constitutes righteousness. It refers to a believer exemplifying Christ-like character, which is perfectly sound by practicing righteousness. It speaks of perfectly adhering to God's perfect standards, which appear in the gospel. Furthermore, when we talk about righteousness, to develop this further, we talked about this in the past, it denotes a child of God doing all that God commands them in this gospel, all that he demands of them in the gospel as his child, and all that he approves, and all that he provides through Christ. Now, Jesus said, uh, when they, they're talking about how, summarizing the law, and this is summarized in the New Testament too. How can you summarize it? Jesus said this in Matthew 22. He said, this, this, these two commands summarize the, old, the commands of the Old Testament. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbors yourself. That's basically what it is. When you look at all the commands and prohibitions in your New Testament, basically at the end of the day, it all comes down to that. Loving God and loving your fellow human being. That's what it comes. And when we do that, we're practicing righteousness. Now, also we study this in Romans. Uh, we can look at practicing righteousness from another perspective, namely our union and identification with Christ, which Paul has talked about in his writings. We studied in Colossians and Romans and all over his writings. Uh, and John does too. It, when we practice righteousness, we're experiencing the righteousness of God. When we do that, we're appropriating by faith our union and identification with Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session, which results in obedience to the various prohibitions and commands that appear in the gospel. So this constitutes loving God without one's entire being and strength and one's neighbor as herself. So therefore, as we've been pointing out, this righteousness, it's a divine righteousness, it's God's righteousness, it refers, and the practice of it means that we're fulfilling our obligations to both God and man. Once again, I want you to know this, I'm, I repeat this, this is a third time today I've repeated it, and I've done it in the past. You should be able to, if somebody was teaching, asking you about this passage, why do you think I repeat? So you can help somebody else remember it. I'm not just, I'm not senile. Maybe someday, and maybe another 15, 14 years from now, when I get Alzheimer's, okay? Because it's in my family. If I get Alzheimer's, then I start repeating. Then you can get a little worried about me, and then you can put me in the home or something, or whatever. But right now, right now, I'm doing it because I'm a good teacher. I'm trying to be a good teacher, I should say. And I, I want you to get this. I want, I'm trying to inculcate you. Jesus this, did this in his teaching. The apostles did. They did it in their writings. And I repeat because I, I want you to get it. Remember it. And because I want you to be able to, you should be able to teach others. It says at the end of Hebrews, the end of Hebrews, we said, we, the, when we do, we saw it at the end of Hebrews, we should be able to teach others, okay? And not, and not we should be able to teach others. And, and so after a period of time, you should be able to teach other believers, you know, not just, not be a pastor. So we see this, uh, we see that righteousness, when we talk about our obligations to God, that means we're, we're required by God to love him with our entire being and to our obligation to our fellow human being is to love our neighbors ourselves. Treat them the way you'd want to be treated. 
Do you like to be lied to, st stolen from? Um, would you like to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, cr criticized unjustly? Would you like to be treated cruelly? Would you like to be belted in the face? Would you like to be uh, uh, slandered? No, who does? So why do we do that to other people? That was, that's, see, when we're not loving our neighbor as ourselves, when we do that. So our obligation to our fellow believer it's to love our fellow believers, Christ loves us. Thus, the practice of divine righteousness, divine love, excuse me, constitutes practicing divine righteousness. So therefore, the practice of that which is truly righteousness refers to a believer practicing so as to exemplify God's integrity and virtue. It refers to us exemplifying Christ-like character, which is perfectly sound and by practicing righteousness. It speaks of us perfectly adhering to God's perfect standards which appear in the word of God. It refers to us doing all that God commands us in the gospel, all that he demands of us as his children, all that he approves, and all that he provides through us through Christ our Lord and Savior. Now, I want to take you to a couple of uh, different... Pa uh, the concept about practicing righteousness. We've talked about this in the past uh, the, um, I'm not sure when we did this, but it might have been later, uh, earlier in in, for, in First John chapter, later in First John chapter two, or maybe earlier in First John chapter three. But when we talk about um, uh, divine righteousness, we talk about divine righteousness. It, it's 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 accomplished in three stages. Okay, we have the stage what we call the positional stage. This is like sanctification in our salvation. Uh, positionally, what God did for us in the past. We received his righteousness in a positional sense. That positional means this is what God did for us at our justification in the past. What he, what he, uh, it sets up the potential for us to practice right, this righteousness, and it gives us the guarantee of being perfected in this righteousness at the rapture, the resurrection of the church, when we get our resurrection bodies. And then there's a per, the perfective sense is getting a, 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 being perfected in this righteousness when we get a resurrection body. But in between... That's the experiential stage. That's what John's talking about here in this particular passage. So uh, let's describe this, this righteousness uh, in the, uh, let's go see these different stages as they're just described to us in scripture. Uh, let's talk, go to Romans chapter three, first of all. We'll look at the positional. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Romans 3.19, Paul writes, Now we know that whenever, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no one is declared righteous before him by the works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So they misinterpret the law, the, the purpose of the law, the Judaizers did. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God, which is attested by the law and the prophets, Old Testament saints, has been disclosed in the person of Jesus. His, during his first advent. Namely, the righteousness of God through faithfulness in Jesus Christ. Now, the Net Bible uh, interprets uh, this word, uh, uh, pis, pistis, in, the word, in that passage. Um, I prefer faith in Jesus Christ. Most of the, trans, uh, the, a lot of translations do that. They went faithfulness of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. But I think the context is, because Paul's trying to see, teach the, uh, the Romans, how, what, what do you have to do to receive 
to be justified and receive the righteousness of God. And it's not by keeping the works of the law. In fact, you look at Romans 4, he uses Abraham as the example that it was faith in the Lord that he was cre righteousness was credited to him. He was justified. So I don't like the translation faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's why one of the few instances I don't like the translation of the Net Bible. He says, for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. This was also to demonstrate his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. So we could say faith in Jesus. And then he says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what principle? Of works. Of works? Excuse me, I didn't read it right. No, but by the principle of faith. For we consider that a person is declared righteous by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? If it's by the law, then, and the Jews only got the law, not the Gentiles, then the Gentiles are up the creek if it's by keeping the law, right? That's what he's saying. But no, God is the God of both Jew and Gentile. So he says, is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since God is one, he will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then nullify the law through faith? No, because we're interpreting the law correctly. The Jews and the Judaizers were saying you had to keep the works of the law. That's how you got justified. Paul's saying you're wrong about that. Uh, we, we, we don't nullify the law. You're, you're the one who's misinterpreting the law. We're upholding the law because we're interpreting it use properly. The law, as Paul just said early in the verse, is to show us our knowledge of sin. That we have sin in our lives. And God is holy. And to point us to Christ. So that's, that's why he says we uphold the law. And then he says, absolutely not. Instead, we uphold the law. Sure, he, did. he absolutely did. Then he gives Abraham as an example of, of, the, of uh, justification by faith. We're going on to justification by faith because that's how we receive positionally the righteousness of God. What then shall we say that Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh, has discovered regarding this matter? Now, Abraham was lived before the law was ever given. So he's a good example. For if Abraham was declared righteous by the works of the law, he has something to boast about, but not before God, because the law wasn't even given in his time. Well after that. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as what? Righteousness. That's righteousness in the positional sense. Now, and then after that, God wanted to bring this righteousness out in Abraham's life, and he did. Now to the one who works... His pay is not credited due to grace, but to, due to obligation. But to the one who does not work, but believes in the one who declares the ungodly righteous, his faith is credited as righteousness. There it is. That's righteousness in a positional sense. Here's another passage that talks about it. Look at 1 Corinthians. And we've gone to these passages in, in, in this order before. We've been, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. So you should be able to explain this to somebody. We've been teaching this a long time. And maybe, but for some of those people who don't know our ministry, haven't been around, you got an excuse. But for those who've been with me for, for a long time, you should be able to know where these passages are. Because we've done this in the past. Look at 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. First Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, look at... Uh, Look at verse 27. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God chose what the world thinks foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world thinks weak to shame the strong. And he's talking about the Christian community. I love that passage. That's great. God, I told you that before. God chose what is low and despised in the world, <laughs> what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus, who, be, who Christ Jesus, became for us what? Wisdom from God and what? Righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written... Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So there's the positional aspect of righteousness. And God uh, is going to perfect us in that righteousness one day. 
And uh, but in the meantime, we're to experience that righteousness in our, li- uh, in our lives now through obedience to his word. Uh, the final stage, look at the, before I show more of the, the, the experiential, the second stage of God's righteousness in our lives, let's look at the final stage. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Galatians 5, 1. Galatians 5.1, talking to believers who were listening to the Judaizers and they were, uh, uh, I think they, if you look at the passage, he's talking about getting circumcised and John, Paul was like livid with them. He called them old foolish Galatians and, uh, and he was angry with them because he taught them better and they were taught by their pa- pastors better than that and they were being deceived by these false teachers and were trying to put them under the law and by the way i believe galatians is the first of paul's writings and you read galatians in light of acts chapter 15 remember there were some jewish believers they believe in jesus christ but they thought when the gentiles got, were getting saved that they needed to go and become obedient to the law and be submit to circumcision, which was required for the Jew under the law, or uh, and to keep the Sabbath and the dietary regulations of the law. Paul said, no, 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 they don't. No, they don't. The church is not governed, uh, with, which is composed of both Jew and Gentile believers, is not governed by the Mosaic law. The law was only given to govern the social, economic, and political life, religious life of the nation of Israel, not the church. So that's why you can throw tithing out the door. And you got churches practicing that. That's part of the law. It's not a part of what the, the gospel is. In fact, if you read about giving, and Paul talks about giving, he never talks about tithing. Read 2 Corinthians 9, it's all about giving. And so he says in Galatians 5.1, this is the context in which he's writing this, Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ is set us free. Stand firm then, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. And I testify again to every man who let himself be circumcised that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You're trying to be declared righteous by the law, have been out, you are trying to be declared righteous by the law, have been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. That doesn't mean they lost their salvation. It just means they're out of fellowship with God. You were saved through faith alone and Christ alone. You receive the gift of the Spirit and righteousness through faith alone and Christ alone at your justification. What, why would you submit to circumcision when it gave you none of those things? Could give you none of those things to start with. And, and the Jews, by keeping circumcision, didn't get the gift of the Spirit and God's righteousness and were declared justified because of keeping circumcision. Were they? No. So why would you keep it? Knuckleheads. That's Wenstrom translation in there. In the, today in day, not today, not today's day and age, our today, today in our day and age, that's what he would probably say. Knucklehead. What are you guys, crazy? Knuckleheads. So... Verse 5, for through the Spirit, by faith, we wait expectantly for the hope of righteousness. Hope, notice it's, we're expectantly waiting for this. This is the future, this righteousness. But I thought I already haven't passed the bill. Pay attention to details. <laughs> He's talking about being perfected in this righteousness when we have a resurrection body. It's future. We read in Romans and 1 Corinthians 1.30, that's a, something that took place at, at our justification. It's in the past, positional. Positional past, think of that. So now he wants us to exemplify right, this righteousness. God's righteousness, he want, he's trying to manifest it in our lives. And we manifest that righteousness when we're obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the word of God. So we're, to, we're, to, we're commanded to practice this righteousness. That's what John's talking about in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28, 228 to 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, so that you might have confidence when you stand before Christ at the Bema seat, and we could be standing before him tonight. The rapture happens right now. We get our resurrection body, we have a nice reunion, the dead in Christ are raised first, and we immediately, right, a split second after that, we get, we get our, our resurrection bodies too. We're perfected, no sin anymore. We'll never sin again, and then we are with the Lord, and then we have to go, after we have the nice reunion, then we have to go stand and give an account at the Bema seat to the Lord, to the Lord individually. Could be tonight. That doesn't humble you. I don't know what it is. Going to do it. AI, yeah, it could be tonight. So if we want to ensure the fact, uh, give ourselves confidence, that if you have confidence now, 
that means you, you've been practicing God's righteousness. I mean, the Holy Spirit's not convicting you of this. That's a good thing. That means you're being encouraged. But if he is convicting you, because you're probably not doing it habitually, then you need to do something. C confess it and just be humble and say, okay, from this moment on, I'm going to do it right through. I'm going to be, if I sin, I'm going to confess it. I'm not going to wait forever to confess my sin. Keep short accounts with God and, do, and habit spend my time practicing God's righteousness in my life and treating people the way I'd want to be treated and loving the body of Christ and praying for them and forgiving them and patient and kind and tolerant of them uh, and, 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 and being a good friend to them. When they, when they, when they sin in gentleness, we, at Galatians 6, 1, we go up to them and, 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 and try to restore them to fellowship with God. And, you know, that's, and treat, treat them in love. Treat, treat them the way God's treating us. How, that, you know, think about how when you, this is very important because we're talking about the practice of righteousness. Think about how you, God treats you. I always say this to people. How does God treat you? That should help you to understand how you should treat others. See, a lot of times, I find sometimes Christians are much more tougher than God is. <laughs> They're like crazy. It's like, God, is, how does he treat you? I mean, I think about what God is. God's very gentle. You know what gentleness means? Gentleness means you're not, bam, hammering them. Gentleness means you're gentle. You could, you could power them. You could hammer them. You could kick them in the butt. And you could really tear them apart because you have that ability. That's what God's like. He could do, tear us apart. He could pick us apart. He could totally demoralize us in a minute if he wanted to. But you notice that God doesn't do the, hit us all at once with things that we do wrong. If he did, we'd never have any. We'd be totally, totally discouraged. Don't say you wouldn't. You I would be. Thank God he's gentle, because I think about the things that God his, deals with me. God goes one thing, and he, 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 he's very gentle. He deals with us, and he's patient with us, because we sin so many ways. We screw up all the time. Think of all the times you screwed up your sin. How many times did you confess the same sin over and over again? And yet, did he crush you that night? Did he hit you, hammer you? No, he's very patient with us. You know, he un see, God understands the big picture. We don't always. So God will go, if, when I say this, he doesn't go after for us for every single thing that we do wrong. James says we sin in many ways. He, ha he goes after core things. He, the things that, that he deals with core attitudes, behaviors, and he goes right at the source of things. He doesn't, get as, he, he doesn't go after every little thing that we do. If, we di if he did that, we would be totally discouraged because there's so many little things that we don't do. We mess up all the way. We don't think we do, but we do. And I look back at the things now that I know now that are sin or I screwed up. And he never, he never went after me. He never, he never killed me on that. He dealt with some of the things that helped me to overcome those things that I were doing. But he was gentle with me. I'm still alive because of the gentleness of God. Let me give a good example of gentleness. You know the ocean. You ever see the ocean? Big ocean, and the waves crash in. I remember one time I was doing John and Alex's wedding, and they put me up in this beautiful hotel overlooking the, uh, in the corner of the room on the 16th floor overlooking the ocean. And the ocean is so loud. Have you ever been, sat, lay, slept, slept near the ocean before? My goodness, it was loud. It put me right to sleep. I remember that. that was one of my nicest sleeps of all time. And I could sleep near the ocean all the time because it just puts you right to sleep, cause, but it's powerful. Is not. I fear the ocean. That's why I don't even want to. You know, I, going on the ocean, okay, make sure where's the life preserver? It's the first thing I look for because I'm not a great swimmer. I sink like a rock. And that ocean's powerful. And you take a little child who's building a little sandcastle on the, on, the, on the beach, and those waves that come, that ocean at any moment, could, a tsunami could happen and wipe that kid out. But it, what does it do? Laps against the shore. Very gentle. That's God. That's kind of like God. He's what the great, the, David said this, the gentleness of God has made me great. One of the great things about Jesus was he was gentle. Didn't he say that? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I am gentle, humble, meek, gentle. Could Jesus have walked around? He could have gone after Mary. He could have hammered her. Did he do that? Did he do that? 
he, there were times he got upset with his apostles, yes. But if he did everything that they would, if he went after them for everything that they did wrong, they'd be up the creek, they'd be discouraged. He knows that. God knows that. I got to pick my spots. I got to figure out what I need to work with these guys where the good teacher does that. So love is gentle. There are times that, yes, love is got to be tough, tough love. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time for every purpose under heaven, Paul, uh, Ecclesiastes said, Psalm said, Solomon said that. There's a time for everything. But this is something we need to, that, that, this is something we should, we're going to learn. God's going to teach us one way or the other about this, whether we know it now a little bit or a lot, or we don't know it at all, what I'm talking about. But God will show you this. And he showed me in my life. And one of the things he does is he, life, God uses life circumstances to bring us to our needs. And he will make us gentle that way. He'll, he'll, be, he'll, he'll kick it out of us then. If we're going to be like, he wants us to be like him. Gentle. God's gentle. Thank God he's gentle. I mean, think about it. We studied with Satan. I mean, he could have hammered, is it five past eight? He could have hammered the devil. I mean, he, has, he, he can hammer the devil. Hammer the, but he's actually, you think about it, he's been pretty gentle when you think about it because he could really he gave him his appeal he still still has act you know god doesn't want it you know god you know god created him it's his creature but god as far as i'm concerned god has been pretty gentle with the devil if you ask me eventually that's you know that god's that's it he's going to be facing his wrath forever god's wrath forever and that's it but god's been gentle with all of us the entire human race i think back before i was an before i was a believer and how gentle he was with me. And all the terrible things I've done. Or what the, all the terrible things I've done as a believer. I mean, you're probably saying, oh, you're talking about, you're thinking about all oh, the sins, that were, what bad sins did you commit, Pastor Bell? I'm talking about any kind of sin. Those are terrible. Every sin is terrible to God. It's an abomination to him. All sin. It's all contrary to his character and will. So, he's gentle with me. When we practice righteousness, We'll practice love. And we'll practice in love. We'll be gentle. We've got a lot more to go. Tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, the, the love command. It's at the end of uh, verse 10 here, which is going to lead us into the centerpiece of the epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. I can't wait to uh, teach that, and uh, that'll be fun to study. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a blessing to your people and bring glory to your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that we would take this uh, lesson and what we've learned here this evening with humility and objectivity and guide us in the application of the things that we've uh, heard. Uh, we also pray, thank you, Father, for everyone that is here this evening. We thank you for your children who are serious students of the word of God that are faithfully here all the time and supporting this ministry and um, so listening, uh, uh, gift giving to the ministry, praying for the ministry, serving in the ministry. We thank you for each person, Father, that is a part of this ministry. And we pray that this lesson would help them in their walk with you and other members of the body of Christ. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.